Good evening and a very warm welcome indeed to a quite different evening celebration for this year. We're coming to you live from Keswick in the Pencil Factory. Uh, as you can see, it's still a bit of a work in progress, but we're going to hear more about that as the week goes on. If you're looking for the youth programme, I'm afraid you are in the wrong place, but if you go to the Virtually Keswick Convention website, and uh, if you click on the little green button there on the bottom, uh, you'll find your way to the right place. Well, my name is Martin. And I'm Kaz, and we're going to be your hosts for the evening celebrations this week. Um, well, though we can't be together physically, we can be together virtually and spiritually as we learn, pray, praise and celebrate the hope that we have in Jesus. Yes, and it is hope that is our theme for the convention this year, or as we're going to hear a little later this evening, as Paul puts it, our eternal encouragement and good hope that we enjoy in Christ. So a very warm welcome to you, whether you're a Keswick regular or whether this is your first time whether you're tuning in from just down the road or from the other side of the world, it's great to have you join us. It really is. And we really recommend that you check out the Virtually Keswick Convention website. It's got a whole lot more information about the programme and other things happening through the week. So each morning there's a prayer meeting, there's the morning Bible readings and seminars, there's a youth and children's programme, and every lunchtime there's a session with the Count Everyone In team. Other events are with Awesome Cutlery and Keswick Unconventional. Well, to enhance our sense of fellowship further, we'd love to hear from you. Do get in touch, send us photos and comments via the normal social media streams. But there's also um, a comments function on the homepage of the website, so do send in things there. And thank you so much to all of you who have already sent things in. Uh, just today, we've had comments and people watching from Singapore and Germany and Brussels and New Jersey. In fact, even this evening, someone commented to say, you are watching uh, Working with Refugees in Beirut, which is amazing. Welcome. And of course, comments from all around the UK. Here's a few that we've received today. This is uh, volunteer Colin with his family from Stockton on Tees. Old habits die hard, hot drinks in the tent, which looks lovely. <laughs> and thank you very much, count everyone in. Great to see you, Sarah and Phoebe. Here's two Hope Hunters. That's our children's programme from Burford in Oxfordshire, armed with craft tray, Bible, coffee, and of course, biscuits. <laughs> And really enjoying this morning's teaching. My first Keswick tuning in from a very rainy forefar in Angus. And um, as he's mentioned, that picture was taken yesterday. So do please send in your comments, send in your pictures. If you are having a barbecue in Barbados or you're enjoying a takeaway in Tahiti or you're glamping in Glamorgan, we want to see it and so does everyone else. So do please uh, send in, get involved and we'll put uh, some of those up each morning and evening on the telly so you can see yourself. Before we go any further, let's commit our evening to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we are all one in Christ Jesus. We thank you for uh, stories of people watching from all over the world. We thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy in you. We thank you for technology, which enables us to do what we're doing right now. And Father, we'd ask this evening, as we meet together, would you, would you meet with us? Would you speak to us? Would you bless us and encourage us and comfort us and challenge us? Father, we ask all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for our good and for your great glory. Amen. Amen. Well, what better way could there be to start this series of evening celebrations by remembering and celebrating God's amazing grace?
Over the years, mission has been central to the Keswick Convention, and this week we're going to have the opportunity to hear what God has been doing in different parts of the world. Well, tonight we're going to hear from Tim Chester, our chairman, as he interviews John and Abby Hunt in Nigeria. Uh, Tim Chester here, uh, chair of Keswick Ministries, and I'm talking to John and Abby Hunt, serving with SIM in Nigeria. If uh, some of you recognize them, that's because they were interviewed at an evening celebration uh, two or three years ago. Uh, John and Abby, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about yourselves and your ministry. First of all, hi. Hi. <laughs> and thank you for taking the time to interview us and for Keswick's long-standing commitment to missions. And we realize that we're, no, we're not special in any particular way, but we're just representing the many people who are serving God faithfully around the world. Um, we, we teach in a Bible college in the far north of Nigeria, and that's part of our commitment really to help strengthen the church here and also to uh, encourage uh, believers to reach out to the Muslims and other unbelievers uh, in this environment. So I teach New Testament and spiritual life at the college and I teach English, and both of us are involved in Hausa translation. John, perhaps I can begin by asking you, what's been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the area where you are in northern Nigeria? Well, <clears throat> there are official statistics and then perhaps a reality which may be a little bit different. The, there's actually very limited testing going on in Nigeria. I think. Uh, out of a population of 200 million so far since the pandemic began, they've tested about 120,000 people so far. So uh, there are uh, about 21,000 official cases, just over 500 deaths. But there are many more what are called uh, mysterious deaths that have happened, which are almost certainly related to COVID-19. Um, in the city near to us, there have been, there's been quite a lot of cases. And in the small village where we are, there have just been two cases recently in the last couple of weeks. Abby, I wonder if you can tell us what the impact has been on you as a family. The COVID-19 situation has actually been a big thing. And uh, it really brings to mind the reality of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 about trusting God with all our might and not relying on our own insight. Because looking at this, we don't know much about it. And uh, there's nothing we can do but trusting God that uh, he will take care of uh, the situation because he knows fully about it, and this uh, explains how limited our knowledge and strength is. And um, it is encouraging to know that God is with us in this storm of pandemic. And uh, when we focus on the impact on our community and the world at large, it is really distressing, but focusing on God gives us courage to move on, knowing that he is in full control and he knows everything about us and he will take care of the situation. John, how has it affected church life and, and indeed your ministry in, uh, in education? Well, first of all, <clears throat> the church, uh, like in the UK, many churches 
uh, have been closed. Um, some churches, or just a few churches, are able to do online services. Uh, but most churches are meeting in small area fellowships, and that's very encouraging because it's, it's really going back more to the New Testament idea of church. And we're hopeful that, that through this, that as people um, begin to discover and develop their gifts and abilities, that that will really enrich the church when we get back to normal, whatever the new normal will be. Theological education, again, it's varied a bit. Um, some of the places have been able to do um, online uh, courses with people either videoing uh, their classes or doing seminars. Although it's challenging for many people because they're not able to access libraries. In our own college, it's rather more difficult because um, many of our students uh, don't have smartphones and, uh, or they don't have internet in their areas. And we're very much a, an oral culture here. And our students really rely on that oral teaching and uh, classroom interaction. And so, we, we're looking forward to being able to be back together again as a community for the education to continue. So pray for a vaccine. What encouraging signs of life and hope are you seeing? Well, I think, first of all, just to say that there is a strong and vibrant church here in the north, despite the, the challenges that there are, security and otherwise. Um, and there are also... Uh, different ways people are reaching out at the moment. Um, there's a revival of using education and uh, um, medical ministry as a way of reaching people. And people are also exploring um, other avenues, new ways, some of which we can't really talk about openly, of, of reaching people for the gospel. So that's very encouraging. Finally, how can we pray for you? Well, let me say a few things generally, and Abby will say a few things personally. Um, our, our main prayer at this time is that the Lord, just in his mercy, will in some way reveal himself to the many Muslims and other unbelievers who may die of COVID-19. And um, we'd ask for prayer uh, too, obviously, because the security situation is complex. Maybe the government and security forces will be able to deal with that but also that the church will have a godly response uh, to when Christians uh, are attacked. And personally, Abby? Um, we always ask for prayers to remain close to God and close to each other in the midst of busyness. And uh, we also want you to please pray for us concerning the books that are being processed for publication. There are books that have been translated into Hausa that are being processed. And also some of the books my husband has written that are in the process of uh, publication. So we'd like you to please pray concerning that area. And also, we want you to please pray for us as we try to establish contact with uh, people outside the school community and uh, pray for those we have already been in contact with so that God will strengthen the relationship, that it will grow to the level of sharing the gospel with them and so that God will prepare their hearts and open their eyes to see the true way of salvation. These are the few points that we really need prayers for. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pray for you now. Father, we pray for the country of Nigeria. We pray that you'd give wisdom to those with authority as they respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and also to the security threats. Uh, we pray for the church, that it will uh, be a voice for peace and that it will proclaim Christ boldly. We pray that many people would turn to you as they feel the fragility of life. And Father, we pray for John and Abby. Keep them close to you, we pray, and we pray for their ministry. We pray for the books they're involved in producing 
that those would be used by you to strengthen believers and to bring Christ to unbelievers. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Abby mentioned there, didn't she, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It reminds us, doesn't it, that for many of us, that the journey is not always straightforward, but our destination is utterly secure. And we're going to listen to a piece of music now, uh, which speaks of that eternal home for which we ultimately hope. Hi everyone, my name's Paul Bell and it's a real privilege to share a song with you at this year's Keswick Convention. And this is a song about heaven, it's a song about hope, it's a song about bringing heaven to earth and it's called Dreams of Home. Caught in between time The start and the finish line Hope of a lifetime Goal of the meantime There's beauty on the journey But oh, the joy of a Arriving safe in open arms and an open door, familiar yet unseen before. This restless heart was born with dreams of home. Treasure house, this place where the heart is distant oasis, peaceful and journey oh the joy of arriving safe in open arms and an open door familiar yet unseen before this restless heart was born with dreams of travel with this hope in our hearts each day that we might bring heaven here with open arm and an open door familiar yet unseen before this restless heart was born with dreams of open arms and an open door familiar yet unseen before this restless heart was born with dreams of home, with dreams of home, with dreams of home, but I'm caught in between times. We're 
We love hearing about missions here at Keswick, but we also love a good resource uh, for mission, a good book to help us grow and serve our Lord Jesus better. So each evening, Jonathan Carswell from 10 of those is gonna be coming to give us some good book recommendations, but also check out the website uh, for more information on book recommendations and how to buy them. And after we've heard uh, Jonathan's book recommendations for this evening, we're gonna watch a short uh, film about the Keswick Fellowship. These are Bible events uh, that have sprung up around the UK and actually all around the world out of the Keswick Convention. What a crazy upside down world we're living in right now. People have got questions. People are searching, looking for answers. We've got a brilliant book to recommend to you. It's called The One Year Book of Hope. It's written by Nancy Guthrie, who in her own life has experienced many ups and downs and trials on a very personal nature. I had the opportunity to ask Nancy a few questions about her book. Nancy, thanks so much for joining us. You've known loss personally in your own, own life, but you've written a book on the theme of hope that takes us back to the Bible, God's word each day. Why did you do that? You know, I found in the midst of my own loss, and as I have walked with a lot of other people through loss, that, you know how people say time heals all wounds? Well, it doesn't. Uh, what we need is a study diet of the Word of God, because the Holy Spirit uses the Word to accomplish healing in our lives in the midst of loss. And, but I also know that in the midst of loss, there were so many things I was trying to make sense of. I'm someone who grew up with the Bible, but I realized um, there were so many things I thought I understood how to make sense of the Bible. And I just had a lot of questions. And so in the one year book of hope, we just work our way through the scriptures, trying to see how all of these passages of scripture, how they speak into and make a genuine difference in the way we think about, feel about, and the way I hope that we can trust God and experience genuine comfort and hope in the midst of loss. So how do you see people using this book as their sort of day-to-day -day devotions? Well, one thing I know about grieving people is that uh, we, it's, most of us can't like take in a big old chunk. So there's just a, a little passage and devotional for every day. And then at the end, it's, it's digging deeper because I don't want people to just listen to what I have to say. I want them to be developing, even if they've never had it before, that getting into God's word every day and experiencing the reality that it can make a difference. So there's a little, here's how you get into God's word. And it's not dated because I also know that it's terrible feeling to be worked through a devotional and get behind. You think I'll just give up for this year. And so it's just 52 weeks worth that aren't dated. Just you miss a week or two, pick it up again and, and start over. Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for helping us get excited about it too. We also have an amazing opportunity to reach out to our friends and neighbours with the good news of the gospel. They're asking questions, they're searching. Years ago, Becky Pippitt wrote what has become a classic, Out of the Salt Shaker. It's a brilliant book on, on evangelism. She has a new one out called Stay Salt, which looks at how we present the gospel in today's culture and answering today's questions. Also, Professor John Lennox has written a little book called Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Both of these are ideal to get so that we are salt and light to today's uh, generation. You can get all three of these books, including the, the one from Nancy. Should be 25 quid if you buy them all together. We're going to do them for 15 quid delivered. for the importance of God's word, becoming like Christ and global mission saw the start of the Keswick Convention. And from its earliest days, that same passion has also been spreading across the UK and world. With distinct family likeness and biblical commitments, like-minded ministries and events have joined with Keswick Ministries to form the Keswick Fellowship. With events joining today, the desire continues to be that believers are equipped to love and live for Jesus Christ as well as to serve the local church. Today in the UK, there are now over 35 Keswick Fellowship events, 
joined together with a memo of understanding and regular meetings with organisers. In 2016, and again in 2019, Keswick Fellowship events have come together in what has been known as the UK Consultation, to share encouragements, learn from each other, and above all, to give God the glory. One event is Keswick Ayrshire. The Keswick Ayrshire event has been running since 2018, with main speakers including Jeremy McCoy and Simon Manchester. Peter Mason preached this year at a one-off online event due to COVID-19. I loved Keswick Ayrshire because it was a new and exciting experience for our area and it allowed people in Kilmarnock to get together on their own doorstep and worshiping God with so many brothers and sisters. It was amazing. Meeting old friends, making new ones and having local churches work together to glorify God was a real boost. And I'm looking forward to our next one. One of the newest Keswick Fellowship events to be launched in the UK was in Gloucestershire last November. In 2019, we ran our first ever Cotswold Bible Festival. It was a fantastic day where over 700 adults, youth and children gathered together. The gospel vision for the day was centred around three words, encourage, equip, enjoy. Encourage one another as we are taught God's word together. Equip ourselves through engaging seminars and an extensive bookstall. Enjoy a fun and memorable day together, a day that under God we trust will grow into the future. There are similar events in the Caribbean, Asia, Australia and New Zealand, the Cayman Islands, Central and Northern Europe, Canada, the USA and parts of Africa. This is truly a blessing, the spread of the gospel of our Lord Jesus by Keswick Fellowship events. Why not check out an event near you? There's a map of the UK showing where UK events are. There are more details on the Keswick Ministries website or you can ring the office. We look forward to hearing from you. This song is a new song and it's a declaration of who Jesus is. He's the only one who is perfect, the only one who can save us, the only one who can stand in our place and take on our sin. And we should never tire of declaring this because we know that it is the most important news that our world can hear and the most important truth for us to hold on to. Let's sing this together.
we're going to turn now to hear God's word read. And then this evening we have Mike Kane, who's the senior pastor at Emmanuel Church in Bristol. He'll be preaching for us. Our Bible passage is being read by Bob Chambers this evening. And uh, Bob is the CEO of FIBA Radio. And uh, a few weeks ago, we asked Bob, uh, what, as, as the head of a mission agency, what does that connection to Keswick Ministries mean for him? My family and I love attending the Keswick Convention each summer. In recent years, I've been up there representing FIBA, a mission agency working across Africa, Asia and the Middle East with partners using radio and other audio media for Christian mission. There are three things really that stand out about the convention that uh, contribute to making it what it is and so special to me. Firstly, a great sense of community, a real sense of coming together for the convention as we see old friends and make new friends, whether that's in town or at the campsite or in the meetings, a real sense of being together for the convention each summer. Secondly, a sense of communion. This is not just a casual holiday friendship, a passing conversation, but a real sense that we have a shared identity as brothers and sisters together in Christ, all one in Christ Jesus, that banner across the doors in the main marquee. Even beyond that, perhaps, I think there's a shared sense of purpose, and the Great Commission encapsulates some of that. As together we meet each summer and we're inspired, we're spurred on to go out from Keswick to pursue what God has set before us, to play the part he would have us play in making him known. Those are just three of the things I think that stand out for me about the Keswick Convention. The community, communion and commission. Before we hear the Bible read and preached, let's pray together. Eternal God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, will you give us a sense of the awesome privilege we have of hearing your word this evening. We rely on your word and commit ourselves to you tonight. We ask you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your wisdom and work by your spirit so that we may know your leading and guidance and open our hearts so that we may know your wonderful love. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This evening's reading is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Hope is like a holiday. You're worn out, so you book a holiday. And the holiday is months away, but, but what happens to you? As soon as it's booked, as soon as it's booked, you start dreaming of the day you can stretch out on the shore of Derwentwater or climb Hell Velen or just take in the view of Buttermere. Having a holiday to look forward to in the future gives you strength to keep going in the present. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and he's writing to us about the future that we have to look forward to. The day of the Lord, he calls it. The day when Jesus comes again and deals with all that is wrong in this world and puts everything right. The word that Paul uses to describe it is glory. 
Jesus' glory is his brilliance. And he says that when Jesus comes again, we will see him and marvel at his brilliance. He will restore creation. He'll restore it to what it was meant to be. And we will look at the world made new and we'll see it as a world without disease, a world without death, because a world without sin. And we will look at what he has done and we will say, isn't he brilliant? He will restore creation. And he will restore us to what we were meant to be. Back in chapter 1, verse 10, Paul talks of Jesus being glorified in his people. He will mend our broken hearts. He will fix our broken lives. And he will make us like him. And we will look at each other and we will say, look at what he has done. Isn't he brilliant? And back in 1 Thessalonians, Paul reminds them of how they had turned from idols to serve the living and true God to wait for his son from heaven. The Thessalonians were waiting for Jesus. They were dreaming of the day when Jesus comes back to make all things new. They were looking forward to glory. And that's the future. That's the future that gave them strength to keep going in the present. Because right now, we read in chapter 1, verse 4, they are facing persecutions and trials. But they keep going. They keep going because they have got the day of the Lord to look forward to. Right now, we might be crying, but we keep going. We keep going because one day, one day he will wipe all our tears dry. And then some people start going round and telling the Thessalonians that the day of the Lord has already come. That, that, that Jesus is not coming back to make all things new. There's, there's nothing to look forward to. That this is it. This world of trials and tears. This is as good as it gets. How did you feel when your holiday was cancelled by COVID? It's hard to keep going through the grind of life, if there's nothing to look forward to. And friends, we, we may not have people telling us that the day of the Lord has been cancelled, but maybe on, on some level we've, we've just lost confidence that Jesus is coming again, that Jesus is going to deal with all that's wrong. He's going to put everything right, wipe all my tears, Make all things new? Really? If we're not sure if the holiday is coming in the future, it's hard to keep going when today is tough. When following Jesus costs us, when standing for him means we get hurt, hard to keep going if we're not sure about the future feels like we're, on, we're in a small boat on a big sea and there is no sign of land. It's hard to keep going. See what Paul says back in, back in chapter 2, verse 3. He says, We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled doesn't want us to become unsettled. He doesn't want us to capsize in the Christian life. He's heading all to chapter 2 verse 15 where he says, so then brothers and sisters stand firm. He wants us to stand firm. And so the first thing he does is insist that the day of the Lord has not been cancelled. Jesus is coming again. And I wonder if, if you've lost confidence 
and whether that's really true. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul connects the coming again of Jesus to the resurrection of Jesus. He talks about how the Thessalonians are waiting for the Son from heaven whom the Lord raised from the dead. It's the resurrection that gives us confidence, that shows us this is not all there is, there is more, that shows us Jesus is alive and he's king and he's coming back. And the point is he's coming back to finish what he started. There was a guy who came to fix our boiler and he came and he opened it up and he was with us about 10 minutes and then he went away. So he had to get some parts. We didn't sit there wondering if he was going to come back or not. We knew, you see, we knew he hadn't just come to open up the boiler. The whole point of his coming was to fix it. It started, but it not finished. So we knew he'd come back to finish it. And he did. And friend, the salvation that Jesus came to bring is, is bigger than we sometimes think. Jesus didn't just come to die and rise and disappear and leave us to it. He came to restore the world to how it was meant to be. And you look at his resurrection and you see the beginnings of the new creation. You see he's started, but you look around, it's very obvious that he's not yet finished. And So will he come back? Yes, because salvation is bigger than we think. The coming back is not the odd bit tacked on at the end. It's about finishing what he started. He came, which means he will come again. And we live in a world in which plans change. Holidays fall through. The future is very uncertain. But if we are Christians, we have what Paul calls a good hope. A good hope, a future to look forward to that will not be cancelled. The day of the Lord is coming. The one who came will come again to finish what he has started, to make all things new, glory. And what Paul says in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12 is between now and that day the world will be awash with lies. Lies that will deceive people and lead them away from God. Lies that will mean that when Jesus comes instead of being invited into glory they'll be shut out. As he says in chapter 2 verse 12 condemned. We had to back up a bit to, to feel what's at stake in our verses. You see, they were unsettled. And Paul settled them. The day of the Lord is coming. But, but can you see that in settling them, Paul might have unsettled them again? Because the day of the Lord is coming, but between now and then, if the world is awash with lies, What's to stop us from falling for them? What's to stop us being deceived? The voices in the papers, every film we see, every song we hear, the voices at school and in college, at work, saying, how can you be so arrogant? How can you be so arrogant as to claim to have the truth? There are, there are lots of different ways of seeing things. Oh, it's people like you. It's people like you who cause division. It's people like you who peddle hate. You've just got to let people be true to who they want to be. Do what they want to do. And what they say sounds so attractive. I don't want them to think that I'm intolerant or, or, or hateful. I want them to like me. And so the day of the Lord is coming... But I feel like I'm in a, in a small boat on a very big sea, blown around by a hostile world. And there are days when I fear I am going to capsize. So 
So yes, glory is coming. I'm just not sure if I will be part of it. Because I'm not sure if I can keep going. You feel that? Here's what Paul wants you to know. Yes, the devil is at work in this world, but so is God. And he is at work in you, and he has got hold of you. God has got hold of you for glory. That's the message of these verses in one line. God has got hold of you for glory. In these verses, look who the hero is. Verse 13, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters. But why, why thank God for you? Because the story of your lives is the story of what he is doing. Verse 13, they are loved by the Lord. Verse 13, because God chose you. Verse 14, he called you. See, there, there I am thinking, I, there, I'm in my small boat on this big sea and I'm not sure if I can keep going. And what Paul is saying is I can keep going because God, he has got hold of me for glory. Let's just take in the medicine of these words. Love by the Lord. We, we look down the years ahead and we, we worry in the face of a hostile world. What if, what if my love for him grows cold? But do you see? He's the hero. Do you see? It's not about your love for him. It's about his love for you. Look at verse 16. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us. Typical Paul, loved us. Past tense. You want to know how much God loves you? Look back to the cross. Look at Jesus. See a love that is prepared to lay down its life for you. Small boat. Big sea. People are going to hate you for what you believe. It's going to be really hard. But whatever happens, the Lord loves you. He's never going to stop loving you. And that's because he chose you. It's a wonderful thing to be chosen, to have someone set their heart on you. Not normally you get chosen because you deserve a place on the team because you're fast or you're successful or you're funny and it makes you feel really good about yourself. They chose me. But what happens when you lose your speed or you're not so successful or you, you don't make people laugh anymore? You get dropped. It's not like that with God. God chose you as first fruits, or if you look at the footnote, because from the beginning, God chose you. From the beginning. At the beginning, before we were born, what had we done to deserve our place on God's team? Nothing. Did you see? There you are in your small boat on this big sea, thinking, I'm going to blow it. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to mess up and God will drop me. No. God chose you. He, he set his heart on you from the beginning. There's nothing you did to deserve it. Which means there's nothing you can do to undeserve it. Which means he's never going to drop you. And do you see why he has chosen us, loved us, chosen us to be saved? It's a contrast with verse 12. A world of people who will be condemned because they don't believe the truth. 
And that's what we fear. What, what if that's me? And Paul is reassuring us. He's saying, God chose you to be saved, not condemned, but saved, to be people who do believe the truth. Do you see? To be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. And even your believing in the truth. You see how even that is the Spirit's work? Even that is what He is doing in you. It's His work. But Paul, are you sure? You sure He's at work in us? You sure He's got hold of us? Paul says, don't you remember? Don't you remember when He called you through our gospel. Verse 14, he called you to this through our gospel. It's language that picks up on what he said to them before. He said, don't you remember when we preached the gospel to you? Do you remember how that gospel turned your lives around? You turned from idols to serve the living God, to wait for his son from heaven. There was a time when you didn't care about being ready for the day of the Lord. But the very fact that today you care, that you want to be there, shows that something in your heart has changed. God has called you. God has got hold of you. And friends, do you see why he's got hold of you? That you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's got hold of you so that when Jesus comes again in glory and the world sees his brilliance, you will not be shut out. You will share in it. People will look at you and marvel at what he has done. And friends, I know that the, the idea of God choosing us raises all kinds of questions, but do you see what a relief it is? A hostile world. Awash with lies. By myself, it's very hard for me to keep hold of him. So do you see what a relief it is that he has got hold of me? See what Paul says in verse 16. Our God is the God who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. The good hope that is ours, that holiday that's never going to be cancelled, is ours. Why? Because by his grace. He gave it to us. See, if glory was something I had to get for myself, not a chance. Small boat, big sea, capsize. But the future is guaranteed because glory is a gift he gave to me. When I was 10, I dreamed of going to Lord's, the cricket ground, to watch a test match. But how could I get there? Or even if I could afford a ticket, how would I know which train to catch to London? How would I know how to find my way across London on the underground? And the whole idea made me nervous. I was just frightened of the crowds. And... But that summer, I got to Lord's. In the late August sunshine, I watched a young David Gower make 71 dreamy runs against New Zealand. How did I get there? My dad took me. He bought the tickets. He drove us to the station. He got us on the right train. In the underground, he held my hand. When we got to St John's Wood, he led me through the crowd into the ground. Then he led me to the stand to find our seats and I remember walking up the steps at the back of the stand in the shade and then 
magical moment as we stepped out into the light and there was Lords in all its glory and I was there to share in it. Why? Because my dad took me. By myself, I was never going to make it to Lords. I was never going to get on the right train and find my way around the tube and push my way through the crowds, but I got there. I got there because Dad took me. And friends, by ourselves, we're never going to make it to glory. It's a hostile world. It's hard to follow Jesus. There's persecution and trials, and the world is awash with lies that are so attractive. If it was all down to me, I'd soon lose my way. Do you see? It isn't all down to me. It isn't all down to you. As my dad got me to Lord's, your Father in heaven has taken you by the hand and he will get you to glory. So then, verse 15, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you whether by word of mouth or by letter see the hostile world says you believe this stuff Paul teaches about Jesus you, you believe he's coming back to judge the world you believe this stuff about how God wants people to live you think this is good so tempting to walk away isn't it especially when it costs us, especially when they hate us for it. It makes for heartache, it makes for tears. And if there is no glory to come, forget it. I'll turn back. I'll just go along with everyone else, just go along with the crowd. But you see, what we've seen is there is glory to come. Jesus is coming back to finish what he started, to make all things new, and we are going to be there. Why? Why can we be so certain? Because it's not just me in my small boat on this big sea awash with lies. Why are we going to be there? Because God has got hold of us. Did you see, 10-year-old me is halfway to Lord's on my own. First sign of getting lost. First time I feel afraid of the crowd, I turn back. But if Dad has got hold of me, I'm not going to turn back. There are moments when I might panic and feel anxious, but I'm not turning back because my Dad is taking me to Lord's. And friends, we're afraid of the crowds, what they say to us, do to us, the lies they tell, very attractive, so tempting to, to turn back, but we're not going to turn back, because why would we turn back? Because God, our Father, is taking us to glory. And there'll be a day when we step out into the light of a world made new and marvel. At what he has done is brilliant that we get to share in it so stand firm but it's hard you see what Paul prays in verse 16 may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Did you see what Paul prays? It's not just that glory is a gift given to us. That the Lord has kind of left tickets for us by the gate for us to collect. The point is... He is with us along the way. When we're in trials and tears, he's got us by the hand. And Paul is praying that, that we would know the reality of that. 
that we would know that we, we can keep going. Because Jesus Christ himself and God our Father are giving us the strength to keep going. Let's pray. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we thank you that we have hope. We thank you that you loved us and chose us and called us to glory. And we are so aware of the world's hostility and of our weakness. And we thank you that the future, the future doesn't depend on our keeping hold of you, but, but your keeping hold of us. And for your amazing grace, we praise you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. How encouraging at the start of our week to be reminded that our God, our Dad, has got hold of us. Well, as the lyrics in our final song say, we cannot know what lies ahead, but we do know the one that has gone before.
Well, thank you so much for joining with us this evening. We do hope and pray you've been blessed and encouraged by all that you've heard this evening. As you know, this year, for many of us, Keswick Ministries included, has been an unprecedented year. Uh, we rely for our convention and our year-round teaching and training ministries on your support, which we greatly value. Thank you for your support in prayer and also financially. If you would like to find out more about how you can support Keswick Ministries financially, do please check out the website where you can find more information. Uh, you'll also find there a donate button in the top right-hand corner of our website. I'm back tomorrow. Uh, we start at 9am with a prayer meeting and then Christopher Ash is back at 10am speaking on Psalm 3. Joe Jackson is doing a seminar on hope and grief at 11.15. All the details about the children's and youth programme can be found online. And a reminder that all the talks from this week can be found on the podcasting apps like iTunes and Spotify, um, on the podcast Kez Talks. And we'll be back here at 8pm tomorrow evening. If you would like somebody to pray for you, then we have a dedicated prayer team who can pray confidentially for you. So please do um, email at prayer at keswickministries.org and see the prayer page on our Keswick website. We're going to close our time together this evening by praying. And to do that, I'm going to pray the words which we had read from two Thessalonians. So why don't you join me as we pray? May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us this evening. Good night and God bless and we do hope you'll join us tomorrow.